This episode contains discussion of murder and assault with a weapon, mentions of mental illness, suicide, rape, and drug use. Listener discretion is advised. In 2013, Caleb Kai Lawrence McGilvery became an internet viral sensation after giving an interview following a traffic accident and assault. As a result of his viral fame, Kai received several offers from various news and entertainment agencies asking for interviews or appearances, with Jimmy Kimmel Live eventually landing the coveted appearance. For a few months, Kai would appear at random places throughout the country. That was until he was arrested in May of 2013 for the murder of 73-year-old New Jersey attorney Joseph Galfi. All right, well, um, this is a case that you probably know from the Netflix documentary, Mm -hmm. which was called The Hatchet-Wielding Hitchhiker. Okay, it didn't have Kai in the name. I don't think so. Okay, yeah, The Hatchet-Wielding Hitchhiker. It is, uh, it's a doozy, you guys. There's gonna, it's about to be a wild ride. We do want to first thank me. Last but not least, I want to thank me. (laughs) And Jasmine B for requesting this case. Wow. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. I know, right? Thank yourself. Um, but also Jasmine. And then thanks to Mark for writing this one up for us. Yes, we appreciate it. Yes, for sure. Um, all right. So again, we kind of feel like the best place to start with this is where most I don't know. I never heard about Kai before this documentary. I don't Dude. remember that happening. No, I don't either. But I have a friend who she was like, I remember when this was on the news. I remember all of this stuff. And I was like, Really? Like, yeah, I, I don't I don't remember it at all. Very interesting. But yeah, I guess some people do. Um, so the the documentary dropped this year on January 10th, 2023. Um, it is described as a shocking documentary that chronicles a happy go lucky nomad's ascent to viral stardom in the steep downward spiral that resulted in his imprisonment. Um, You don't need to have watched the documentary before we talk about the case today. We're going to go over what happens in the documentary. Um, I enjoyed watching it like it was interesting. I do think they left a hell of a lot of stuff out. Yeah. With regards to his, like, why he's in jail now. Mm -hmm. They really, really focused on the viral sensation thing absolutely and i mean we'll talk about it but they really focused not only on the viral sensation thing but like his they spent a lot of time talking to people that were kind of like wrangling him or like involved in having to get him to these certain places and while it is interesting i feel like that didn't need to be the main focus like if we focused can't you know that taco commercial por que los dos why can't we have both Exactly. And it was, what, an hour and a half long or something? Yeah. So they spent like an hour and 15 minutes talking about this part of it Mm -hmm. and him going on TV and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, but like. And his like wild and crazy antics and then. Yeah. So then at the end of it, you're like, wait, what? What? Why? I didn't even, I mean, I guess since I didn't know the story, I wouldn't have known, but I didn't even know that he there was this terrible thing that happened at the very, like, I had no idea. I was like, all right, it's, people are talking about watching this. I'll watch it. But Mm -hmm. I was like, it just felt like a E Hollywood story of like this guy who, you know, rose to fame and then died out a little bit. And I was like, oh, there's more. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I thought that was a little bit strange. Um, But if you don't know the story, we start with a car crash on February 1st, 2013. This is a little after 2 p.m., uh, Jessup Reisbeck was the sports reporter for the local Fox affiliate, that's KMPH-TV in Fresno, California. So he's the sports reporter for the local affiliate in Fresno, California. That day they were short on reporters, so Jessup was sent out to cover this car crash. And man, was that serendipitous for him. Mm-hmm. He's like, looks big time now? I don't know. I don't know what he is, but... He went from like 
I mean, it's it's amazing if you're a reporter on a local station. I'm not saying anything about that. But he just literally was like, took that. And then he kind of went viral, too. But um, you want to talk about a glow up, you guys. Look mm. up Jake, Jessup Reisbeck. Um, so anyway, they're short on reporters. They send him out there. And the reports coming into the station were pretty strange. So they felt like they wanted to get somebody out there. They wanted to see what was going on. Um, initially, the description of the accident that went over the police scanners was that it was pretty bad. I mean, a person had actually been pinned between a car and a truck for this utility company. And the driver of the car had gotten out after the accident and was yelling some really, really disgusting and racist things. Um, He was claiming to be Jesus Christ. He was saying some other things. And the man that was pinned in between was a black man. And he's saying some very racist things. So, um, and he worked for the utility company that owned the truck. And while the driver, like the driver is yelling the way that he's yelling, the things that he's saying, the assumption was, he saw a black man and hit him with a car. Mm-hmm. Like, because of that. I mean, it's horrific. He's still yelling that he's Jesus. He's going to save everyone. It's an interesting way to save people by hitting somebody with a car. But yeah, what do I know, I guess? So this is all happening and bystanders are seeing what's going on. So they rush up to try to help this man because he's, he's pinned. And um, as they come up, he starts attacking them. And he was, they said, six foot, four inches, 300 pounds. His name is Jet Simmons McBride. He grabbed a woman who was trying to help and he put her in, she called it a bear hug, but he started trying to choke her. As Jessup was interviewing the woman who was attacked, she describes a, quote, homeless hitchhiker looking guy getting out of the passenger seat of the car, then coming up behind Jet McBride and hitting him in the head with a hatchet until he released her. And so Jessup's kind of looking around while he's doing this interview. He sees who he thinks is the person she's referring to walking around on the on the like street across the street. He's got a backpack. um, So Jessup goes over to him and is like, hey, do you want to talk? And so this is how the world was introduced to Kai. And so Jessup says, "Um, you know, can we talk to you? And Kai kind of shrugs and (laughs) he goes, what do you want to talk about? As if this entire thing that he just was involved in, in a, you know, weird way, just didn't happen. Like, yeah. Okay, (laughs) sure. What do you want to talk about? Yeah, I react way more dramatically over tiny little things that, you know, like, God, don't even get me started about the insect that I found in my bed. I, I, I can't stop talking about that. That was a big moment in my life. This is completely different. And he's like, what's the big deal? Like, what are you... What do you want to talk about? So at one point, Kai says that woman was in danger. He had just finished what looked like at the time killing somebody. And if I hadn't done that, he would have killed more people. And when he was asked why he was even with the driver, like why he was riding with Jet McBride, he's like, I was just hitchhiking. I just met him. And he's like, thank God I was hitchhiking. Like, you know, because what else would have happened? Um, And he said that you know, while they were driving, McBride was saying some pretty disturbing things. And he just kept telling Kai that he was Jesus Christ. And he said, at one point he said that he'd been in the Virgin Islands one time. And at that time he had raped a 14 year old girl. He also said um, that McBride told him, I've come to realize I'm Jesus Christ and I can get away with anything that I want to. And then he says, watch this. And then that's when he drives into the worker. Um. So after Kai gives this interview to Jessup, other reporters come up and they're like, hey, 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 you know, we want to talk to you. We want to talk to you. And to Jessup's surprise, because it seemed like Kai was like cool talking with everybody. He's really charismatic. He seemed like he was enjoying the spotlight. He was like, okay, everybody's going to get an interview with him, right? And Kai was like, nope, bye. Like, he wouldn't talk to anybody else. And then he just sort of... GTFO. Walked away. Yeah. So after the incident, Kai was questioned by the police. He was released. The day after the accident, Jessup uploaded his interview with Kai to the YouTube. Now, this is 2013. Mm -hmm. It took some time. Early YouTube in days. Early YouTube. Yeah. Um, 
so he uploads it and it immediately went viral. Um, and as of today, it has 8.1 million views. The Gregory brothers who did Iskown, you know, I don't know the other ones. I don't either. There's Chrissy Wake Up, Bed Intruder Song, but it's Cone. That's my, that's the only Let's one that. Go. That song <laughs> lives absolute rent free in my head. Mm hmm. Absolutely. We cannot talk about having corn for dinner. And then I'm like, the big love of nubs is the truth. <laughs> like, I just can't not sing it. But exactly. So they sampled that interview and they made a song with it they auto-tuned it or whatever because you know kai's famous quote is smash 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 and like they made a whole thing about it so there's that smash 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 but everybody after seeing this interview everybody wanted a piece of kai the entertainment industry wanted a piece of kai and honestly it's disgusting mm -hmm. like Nobody looked at him and thought, and look, his his mental health issues are not hard to spot. Nobody looked at him and said, let's get him some help. Let's get him some food. You know, like, I mean, it, it came along with it that they would, you know, give him food or whatever. But all they saw when they looked at him was dollar signs. So all of these like TV producers and all these people were trying to get with him. So. The Jimmy Kimmel show wanted to get him on their show. And then the producers who worked with or who worked on Keeping Up with the Kardashians wanted to do a reality show with Kai. But they couldn't find him because, as he liked to say, he was home free. He did not have an address. So they had to try to figure out how to find him. So they go to his Facebook account and a lot of people reached out to him on Facebook. Um, and if they couldn't get him there, they just contacted Jessup. And Jessup did have his email address. So Jessup's email account was absolutely blowing up. And he said as quickly as he could like reply to or delete emails, he had like hundreds more to replace them. Like it was just insanity. Um, and there were emails from all over the world. Just people want to know, how can I get to Kai? Um, they're like, they're so, they exploited or wanted to exploit him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's do a, let's do a homeless hitchhiker reality TV show. Now, would he have made money on it? Yes. But they weren't doing it to help him. They weren't doing it out of the goodness of their hearts to help him. They certainly weren't worried about addressing in, any of his medical or mental health issues. That just makes for better ratings. Yeah, I was going to say, from what I've seen from specific people in the entertainment industry, they're, they're like piranhas. They're like, the the crazier shit gets, the more views and ratings we get. And that's great. We don't want, you know, uh, this is speculation, of course, like allegedly they maybe wouldn't want him to get better or to find housing if he wanted to or whatever it was just like how how crazy can we get and get it on film right yeah because if he got any of that kind of help it wouldn't be to them as interesting right i mean it, it's just awful so at this point jessup is kind of acting like his agent because he's the only one who has contact or real, like the end yeah. with him yeah right so he sends him a message and he's like, hey, you know, there's all these people that want to get a hold of you. And um, he's like, here's the thing, though. Like, we know each other, right? And so, like, we're friends. So, like, I would love it if I could be the one to tell your story first and then you go on to do these other things. Everybody wants a piece of him. Mm -hmm. Like, not like, again, no, but just nobody sat down and said, hey, I, you know, I'm in this industry and I want to let you know what this is, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And here's here's how this is going to play out if you do this or this is how this works. Just nobody looking out for like, but this is the safest option for you or what's in your best interest or what do you want, Kai? Mm -hmm. And then here's maybe what could achieve that or whatever it is. It's just, you know, whatever. Um, So Kai agrees. Jessup goes to pick him up to meet him. And the cameraman who was recording that day said that 
the vibe between the viral video and the in-person video or interview was completely different. Like he said in person, Kai was a complete loose cannon. You didn't know what he was going to do. You didn't know what he was going to say. Um, after their interview, Jessup took Kai out to eat. He laid out everything that he had been sent. And essentially he told Kai, like, look, all you have to do is choose who you want to talk to. You're going to be rich and famous pretty much instantly. Um, and he's like, you could be a millionaire overnight. And Jessup says, like, he's talking to Kai. He's explaining this to him. And Kai was, like, kind of not really paying attention. He was just, like, wandering off and, like, not really. Like, he could tell he was, like, not super interested in the conversation. And Kai's like, I, I kind of just want to go to the Bay Area and smoke weed. Like, I don't want to do all that. Yeah. that That wasn't in his... The, the, being famous, I don't even... And again, speculation, I don't know, but it doesn't seem like even exorbitant amount of money was a priority to him. Like, he's just, he just wants to, like, wanted to float in the wind and just do his thing and go surfing and skateboard and smoke weed. That's all he wanted to do. That's the life he enjoyed. I mean, he, mm -hmm. you know, like, he, he didn't want to be beholden to anybody, mm -mm. you know? So... Jessup tells the Kardashian producers this, and the Kardashian producers say, we'll give you a whole limo full of weed if you'll talk to us. So he agrees. So the producers and their people go to Kai. They find him. They got him to sign a contract for a reality TV show. Wasn't this the part where they said it took him forever to sign because he signed it in hieroglyphics? Yes. And for whatever reason, they decided that that was good enough. Aren't you supposed to be of sound mind to sign a contract to enter into something like that? Like you would think. And so we're looking at that and saying he knows what he's he knows what he's signing. Mm -hmm. This is ethical. Right. But they thought they were going to make a reality show that was something, you know, that had never been done before. And it was, quote, homeless people living happily on the streets. So they put Kai up in a hotel. Isn't that the opposite? Anyway. Uh -huh. As soon as he goes into his room, he finds the liquor bottles, right? And these are not airplane airplane size bottles. They're full bottles. Kai opens the bottle of Jack and he just starts guzzling. So they're like, oh gosh, <laughs> this is going to be an expensive <clears throat> thing. Um, so a little while later, they go down to the lobby. He's riding his skateboard through the lobby. And this is like a pretty nice hotel. I don't remember which hotel it was, but they said it was like a fancy hotel. And... Um, he leaves. At this point, they've got a handler to make sure he gets, you know, I think of like, get him to the Greek. Like, <laughs> yes, yeah. Just get him there, you know, just get him from one place to the other. But that's their job. And the handler was like, <sighs> okay, I didn't know it was going to be this hard. Um, so after or as they're leaving, security comes out and says, he can't come back in here. Like, you can't do that. You cannot ride your skateboard through the lobby. Like, absolutely not. Well, and um, they didn't even know that he had gone outside and peed on the sidewalk before he even went into the hotel. So exactly. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's some stuff happening that is not... Uh, compatible with the vibe they're trying to give off so they're like he's just he can't come back um so after they got kicked out kai took off running down the road he pulls out a knife he tries to throw it into the ground um at this point the producers are like i don't know if we can do a show with this guy right and like one of the guys that i guess was a handler was like he's not going to be able to report to set every day He's not going to be able to show up for call time or whatever it is, you know? You, you don't know when he's going to be where. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't, like, this is not somebody who's going to be like, okay, I have to go to work every day at 8 o'clock or whatever, you know? Like, right. that's just never going to happen. Um, So they're kind of in this, like, man, I don't know. What are we going to do? But in the meantime, he has this appearance on Jimmy Kimmel scheduled. And that was on February the 11th. So not long after his appearance on Kimmel, which was so awkward. Oh, my gosh. It was so cringy. It was so cringy. He just sort of disappeared and went back out on the road. And he would pop up randomly on social media. 
at various places, usually in videos of people like recognizing him, like, oh my God, you're Kai, and they take a video and post it or whatever. Um, and it just kind of like Jimmy Kimmel was sort of the like height, and then it started to just all come down from there. So in one interview after the initial incident, Kai said, quote, as far as anybody I grew up with is concerned, I'm already dead. And in Kai's mind, it was him against the world. It That's what it seems like it was like for him. And after his arrest, a lot of his relatives came out and spoke about Kai and his past. And the Netflix documentary touched on his childhood a little bit. And to put it lightly, it was less than uh, stellar. Mm hmm. Kai was born in Canada, and when he was around four years old, his parents separated. Kai was born as Caleb McGilvery, and it appears that he changed his name when he cut ties with his family. His cousin said that growing up with Kai, he was very loud, he was very funny, but he was also mischievous. And he said that when they were young, he, the cousin, um, he said that he had a normal childhood. He was able to act like a, a like a little boy, like go outside, play with friends in the neighborhood, that kind of stuff. But Kai wasn't allowed to do those things. And his cousin put it as, quote, he wasn't given that privilege. And Kai was kept in a locked or kept locked in his room for long periods of time. There were thick, dark blankets over his windows to make it look like it was dark outside. And his cousin said that even though the blankets were there, Kai could hear the other little kids outside playing. And he said, the cousin said, you know, growing up, they knew that Kai had it difficult. When he was around 13 years old, Kai started or tried to start a fire in his house. And not long after, Shirley, who was Kai's mother, decided to send him to Bosco Homes, which is basically a facility where they send troubled teens who need a home. The cousin said that as they were growing up, Kai had basically a hair trigger. He had a difficult time distinguishing when someone was laughing with him or laughing at him, and that really upset him. Um, and if he thought that you were laughing at him or making fun of him, he would go into what the cousin said, quote, little rages, but he would snap out of them pretty quickly. And the cousin also said that he feels like Kai had, has mental health issues, which for all his childhood were basically untreated. Kai's father, Gil, later said that he thinks Kai has post-traumatic stress disorder from the way that he grew up. But, wonder why. <laughs> right, exactly. They actually did interview Shirley in the documentary. Which I was, was shocked. I was going to say, it was surprising to see her because she's not... The cousin and other people kind of... Well, Kai himself didn't really paint the way that he was brought up in the best light. And so for her to go on there and she kind of defended it. She said that she never locked him in his room for hours on end. And she did, quote, occasionally have to prevent him from leaving his room too early because he would wake up sometimes before she did. And then when he did this, he would get into stuff that she said could harm him. So that, according to her, maybe in her eyes, she was being responsible and preventing him from getting into things that could hurt him. And she seemed to think that it was in his best interest and for his safety. And she said that doctors lean towards an ADHD diagnosis, but no clear-cut diagnosis for Kai has ever come out. Kai's experience in the group home wasn't great either. He would be sent from one to another to another. And in these, one of these homes, Kai claimed that he was physically and mentally abused. His father said later that he felt like Kai resented him because of the divorce. In the divorce proceedings, Shirley got custody of Kai, and afterwards, Gil remarried, and he went on to have more children. And he felt like Kai was angry with him for having a new family and not coming to rescue him from the group homes that he was being forced to live in. I mean, did he try? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Because if he tried and he was unsuccessful, that's one thing. But, like, you know your child is living in group homes. It... It felt very much to me like everybody was just like, it's too much trouble. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's sad. It's really sad. Mm -hmm. I don't and know. I, you know, I know that at that time, mental health care, we have, we still have a super, super long way to go, but it was not what it is today. Mm -hmm. And I know that it can be very expensive. And like, there's a lot of barriers for people to get mental health treatment if they need it and therapy, especially for children. I mean, if you've, you know, if you're already having a hard time, providing the necessities you want to add therapy on top of that i mean that's i understand that that's very difficult um but you would think and i don't know how it is 
I honestly don't, I'm not familiar or well-versed with the way custody goes for, you know, I've heard some things I don't know. I've never been in a custody battle or anything like that. And I don't, absolutely don't know how it goes in Canada because this is, he's from Canada. But for the, for Shirley to get full custody of him, shouldn't Gil have had some rights? Like, couldn't he have said, no, we don't want him going into a group home? Did he have to agree to that? Did Shirley have all of the pull in that? Right. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It all depends on, yeah, their particular custody agreement. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, he's like, well, I think he was just mad because I never rescued him from the group home. But I just, we just don't know. Could he have? Right. You know? Yeah. And if he couldn't, then he couldn't, you know, but um, you can just see all of these things and being like, like Charlie being like, well, there's a big, big, big difference between keeping him in his room from 6 to 7 a.m. when you wake up to keeping him in his room, keeping him in his room from 4 p.m. the night before to 8 p.m. the next day. Right. You know, there, and I don't know the exact times. But his cousin in the has documentary corroborated it. Yeah, says he didn't get to go out and play like other kids did. So when Kai turned 18, the group Holmes spit him out and he had to fend for himself. And that's when he cut ties with his family and he went out into the world. And Gil said that the last time he saw him around was Christmas of 2010. Kai showed up to spend some time around the holidays and with his family, and that was it. So in 2013, Kai kind of popped back up into their lives when he went viral from the interview, and Shirley said that she was worried because Kai was so trusting in everyone he met, and she thought that he would get taken advantage of. And that's a real fear because it's essentially exactly what happened. As soon as he became, quote, the hatchet-wielding hitchhiker, everyone wanted to get a hold of him. Everyone wanted him to come on their show, to give an interview, and the Kardashian producers, like we talked about, wanted to make a show about him. And They weren't doing this out of the kindness of their hearts. They saw the dollar signs and they just wanted to lock Kai into agreement before anyone else had a chance to get him for themselves. Now we have to switch gears a little bit and talk about a murder. So, Joseph Galfi was a military veteran who worked as an attorney in Clark Township, New Jersey. He'd lived in his home for 15 years. Friends described him as, quote, a frail, mild-mannered, and helpful individual incapable of harming even a fly. One other thing that Joseph was known for was his schedule. So he was the type of person who was on schedule. He was never late. Um, And so it came as a pretty big surprise to one of Joseph's neighbors when they received a call from his former secretary on May 13th, 2013. She said that the the attorney was expected in court that morning, but didn't show up. And then she couldn't reach him on his cell phone. Now, that's a big damn deal. Like, Mm -hmm. this is not the way Joseph... Yeah. Well, and like, even if you're a really, really regimented person and you always have the schedule or whatever, it's concerning if you don't like maybe show up to work. But he was supposed to be in court. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you like, that's not a thing where you can be like, oh, shoot, I ran late or like, like, you can't do that. There's a judge there. (laughs) Like, it's court. You can't, you know, so that's like everybody's red flags just went way up. 100%. Do you know how I can tell that you're a millennial? Oh, the phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. that's the phone. Yeah, my kids are boop, like. Boop, 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 boop. Yep. Yep. Exactly. That's funny. It's so natural to just. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, you can't just be like, oops, you know. Sorry. <laughs> show up 20 minutes late with your Starbucks in your hand or whatever and be like, oopsie, judge. Like, whatever. So that's that's a big deal. Bob is the neighbor. He goes over to check on Joseph. Um, but he sees that his newspaper is still laying on the front porch and the house is like eerily quiet. So he calls the police and asks them to do a welfare check. Um, it did not go well. Uh, the 73 year old was found dead in a pool of blood on the floor of his master bedroom, just clothed in his underwear and socks. The home wasn't in bad condition. It wasn't ransacked. There were no signs of forced entry. So the authorities did not suspect a break-in. An autopsy revealed that Joseph had died from severe blunt force trauma to the head, which had crushed most of his facial bones and his ear. And after some deliberation, it was concluded that he had likely been stomped to death. That is, what a, oh gosh, it's, it's just awful. Like, 
What a terrible way to go. I know. That's horrific. Uh, due to the lack of signs of forced entry and the house being surprisingly organized, the investigators believed that Joseph knew who had attacked him. So they're going through the crime scene and they've found a paper under the laptop in the family room with the phone number of Kai Lawrence. And they also found a train ticket from the morning of May the 12th, 2013. The detectives went to the train station and pulled the surveillance footage. And they were able to identify the victim buying a ticket and speaking to a man with what they called crazy hair. And so they identified him as Caleb McGilvery, which is Kai Lawrence. About three months or so after his interview with Jessup and going viral, Kai posted the following on Facebook, quote, what would you do if you woke up with a groggy head, metallic taste in your mouth in a stranger's house, walk to the mirror, and you guys, I'm, I'm going to be a grown up here. I knew this was going to be tough for you. I'm going to be grown up. And seen cum dripping from the side of your face from your mouth and started retching, realizing that someone had drugged, raped, and blown their fucking load in you. What would you do? And that was May 14th, 2013. I'm proud of you. You, you did great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um. My question, if this was, if this happened the night before, and I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be vulgar, but like, I'm assuming what he means is residue dripping. It's not going to still be actually dripping. Right. I don't know. My, that was my first, like, and I, I don't know. There's just, there's a lot of questions around all of this. So the way he describes it is almost like it is physically dripping. Yeah. But. Anyway, so investigators started to look for Kai. Uh, obviously, they'd seen the interview. They saw Kai talking about, and look, like, it doesn't look great because this person has been possibly stomped to death, but their head being smashed in. And he's on YouTube going, smash, smash, so mash, and being, like, proud of it. You know, before that, everybody w was laughing it up, right? Like, ha, ha, Well, he was heralded as a hero. Mm hmm. And everybody seemed, yeah, just like, good job for you. And look, that guy needed to be stopped. Um, And he didn't do it with the he did it with the the sharp end. I mean, he I think he started with the dull end and then he flipped it around and did it with the sharp it around. End. Yeah. And that guy lived, which is everybody lived in that situation, which is honestly incredible. But like. He's talking about this like. You know, he he wasn't sitting there like, oh, my God, I, I had I had to hit somebody in the head with a hatchet to get them off of somebody like he wasn't um, in any type of emotional distress or anything after having done that. He seemed pretty excited about it. Everybody around him was real excited about it. Like, yeah. And then and then you just see everybody quoting, you know, smash, smash, so much. People made T-shirts and like, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's a whole thing. So the investigators kind of looked at that as like. A There's a pattern to violence. Yeah. Like, he obviously enjoyed it. He's done it before. You know, whatever. So, um, and if he feels like he's doing something to protect somebody, what's he willing to do kind of thing? They talked with authorities back in California, but they didn't ha really have any way to contact Kai. So, Jessup reached out to Kai to try to find him, but he got no response. Um, then, investigators learned that Kai had planned on meeting a fan in the area. And when they contacted her, she confirmed that she had seen Kai and she had pictures. So at this point, Kai has cut his hair shorter. He's pretty much buzzed it at this point. Eh, maybe not buzz. It's yeah. very short. It was short, though. Yeah. He had very long hair before that. Um, and he had a really large, like, face and neck tattoo that he'd gotten. So he's not making it really easy for him to just blend in at this point. Um, but they also don't know what they're looking for. You know, like it's it's changed his appearance a lot. You know, yeah. like what you're looking for is somebody with long hair and That's no face true. tattoos. And then now all of a sudden it's like, well, I don't know if you if you're looking for that person and then you see somebody who has got short hair and a mm -hmm. massive face and neck tattoo. It's like, right. No, nope, like, not oh, it. That's not him. Yeah. The only thing that kind of jacked with that, if that was the plan, is that. Somebody told him he got that. So then yeah. it's like, yeah. whoops. Um, but and she said she was shocked at first because of the short hair, um, because he it was not short. Even when they made plans, it had, you know, he had just cut it. And so 
Um, and of course, they took pictures together, so he they used these to try to find him. On May 16th, 2013, in Philadelphia, a Starbucks employee looked up and saw Kai getting coffee. And so the employee called the police, they show up, but Kai was nowhere to be found. One officer thought that the nearby Greyhound station might be where Kai went, and sure enough, there he was. So they call for backup. Kai is arrested without incident. And as they were walking Kai past the press after his arrest, which is also very frustrating because you know, I mean, I guess the press has police scanners and stuff too, but you know, somebody called somebody and was like, hey, we're about to arrest that guy, the hitchhiker guy, come get it on camera, you know, just right off. So the, the press is saying, can you just tell us what happened? And Kai just says, I've been advised by an attorney not to say anything to you guys. I'd like to say thank you to all the supporters. And you know, when he, when he talked to Jessup in that first interview, the first thing he said is like, no matter what you've done, you deserve love. And like, I don't know, there's a, there's definitely a kind spirit somewhere in there, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in his interrogation, uh, investigators asked Kai what happened, and he said that he met Galfi in Times Square when Galfi approached him and asked where he was headed. And he, Galfi apparently said like he looked like he was lost or something. So Kai told him he was going to Jersey, and Galfi said that he was heading that way as well. And then he offered him some food and a ride. And Kai said, quote, at first I thought he was really nice, and then he raped me. And Kai goes on to say that after they ate, they go to Galfi's house, they drink some beer. He said that Galfi put the beer in a glass, pouring out of the bottle. And then they watched some TV and drank a few beers. And Kai said after a bit, he was extremely tired, so he went to bed. And then he said the next morning, he woke up with a strange metallic taste in his mouth. He looked in the mirror and there was semen coming down the side of his face. When asked if he confronted Galfi, Kai said that he didn't. He said that Galfi then drives him to the train station. He bought him a ticket to go to Asbury. I hope I'm saying that right. I never know how to say uh, names of cities. I but know. Well, it's really disappointing that you don't know the name of every city in the whole world. I know. Do I mean, research. I'm human. I'm sorry. So they see this on um, the well, They're asking him about this, but they also have the uh, CCTV footage of this as well. But. So they said their goodbyes. Galfi gave him a number to call if he ever was in the area and needed a place to stay. Then Kai goes to Asbury because he was supposed to meet with some friends, but they were never able to meet. So at this point in the interrogation, Kai seems kind of shell-shocked and he says, quote, I got raped and you you say you're charging me with first degree murder. And the detective is like, yeah, and then asked Kai what he did next. Kai went back to the train station and he said he called Galfi to see if he could stay another night with him. Kai said they ate cheeseburgers, drank a few beers, and that's all he could remember from that night. And he said the next thing he remembered was waking up on the floor with Galfi trying to pull his pants down and Galfi is only dressed in his underwear. Kai says that he hit him and Galfi was trying to throw him around and Kai said all he could remember was that he hit him. And he couldn't say if he used his hands or elbow. Maybe he need him. He doesn't really know. And then finally, he hit Galfi in the head and he got off of him. And at this point in the interview, Kai said, quote, I should probably talk to a lawyer, shouldn't I? And the detective said, I can't give you legal advice. That's up to you. Kai then said that he did want to talk to a lawyer and the detective stopped questioning him. But before they left, they were like, OK, once I walk out of this room, I won't be able to talk to you again. Do you I can't have help you? Exactly. Do you have any questions for us? And Kai asks him what the penalty for that crime is in New Jersey. And the detectives are like, look, that's up to a judge and a jury to decide. I can't tell you. And Kai asks if the death penalty is legal in New Jersey. And they say, um, okay, we're done now. Okay. You asked for an attorney, so we're gonna have to stop talking, okay? Good luck. Yep, they said good luck. They walked out of the room. Why ask if he has any questions so you can That's be like, I, I mean, that is literally like calling to tell somebody you can't fucking talk right now. Exactly. Do you have Hello? any questions? I can't talk. Yeah. Can't, uh, can't answer that one. Anything can't else? No, any can't questions. answer that one. No. Mm -mm. Look, you're the one who said you didn't want to talk to us. So I'm not obligated to answer any of your questions. Like gaslighting, son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. What was a question that they would have answered? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like, do you have any questions? I can't answer any questions. Why do you? Why do you? Yeah. I thought you asked me about any questions. Like, and I hate the, I can't give you legal advice. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's like, of course you're going to do everything, you know, because they always lead into that. Look, I mean, if you want a lawyer, get a lawyer. 
if you want to make a big deal about this and you want to get a lawyer and you want to like, you know, that's you. Okay. Okay. Um, but I'm just trying to help you. So well, like, if you don't want me to be able to help you anymore, then fine, get a lawyer. And then I walk out of this room and I can't do another thing to help you. Well, and they imply that, all right, if you want to get a lawyer, I mean, people who are guilty, they get lawyers all the time. So if that's yes. something that that's a road that you want to go down, by all means. That should be completely illegal for them to say. And how many mm-hmm. times have we heard that in interrogations? Oh, oh I mean, yeah. if you haven't done anything, what do you need a lawyer for? Exactly. I just wonder, though, because whenever the press was there interview or trying to get, you know, like, hey, can you tell us what happened? Kai says he's been advised by an attorney not to speak. You would think that if he had talked to an attorney, they would be like, do not answer any questions. We will meet you there. But then he asked police, should I get an attorney? Mm hmm. That's very interesting, too. Yeah, I wonder at what point he did talk to a lawyer, because if he did talk to a lawyer before that, then this whole interrogation should not have been used at all, right? 100%. It's like they, because any lawyer, if you're put in this position, if you call somebody and you say, I've been arrested for murder, they are going to say, don't speak to them. Don't say anything. Mm -mm. You just tell them I'm on the way. Yeah. 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 So I just, I don't understand that the timeline of that kind of stuff, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. Kai was charged with Galfi's murder and throughout the interrogation process and leading up to his trial, he maintained that he acted in self-defense. The police maintained that the sexual encounter between the two was consensual and that Kai had planned the murder, making it premeditated. What evidence do you have of this, please? Well, I mean, my God, how many times have we talked about that too? Like, they don't have a reason for this line of thought, but they're like, well, from what we can surmise, it seems as, you know, it's like, you just, Mm -hmm. maybe, but where's the proof? Like, you don't have any. Yeah, because you've got a defendant saying, well, I acted in self-defense, and then you have the prosecutor being like, no, we, our investigation revealed that um, this was a consensual encounter. Mm -hmm. They, They don't have they might never, ever, ever bring any evidence forward that proves that. But they say, our our investigation has revealed blah, 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 blah. And then they'll say, and he planned this murder. It was premeditated. There's evidence of that. And the weight that that holds for a jury. Yep. Mm-hmm. They don't have what to prove evidence? it, but all they have to say is that. And then the jury's like, oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Whoa. because reasonable doubt a lot of times I feel like looks if a if a defense attorney is able to poke holes in some of that testimony, mm-hmm. reasonable doubt is tough because reasonable doubt doesn't isn't definitive. It's not OK, so that definitely didn't happen. It's but is there another explanation for what happened? And would a reasonable person be able to come to that conclusion? And if so, then you haven't proven it beyond a reasonable doubt. But because there's not a definitive video of what happened or somebody admitted, you know, like whatever, reasonable doubt just looks like maybe, maybe not. And so I trust the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. I trust the police. Like it just, it doesn't look like enough. I think reasonable doubt is just so very misunderstood. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's not like the defense can be like, well, our investigation has concluded that it was it was done in self-defense because mm-hmm. they would have to show proof of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Burden of proof is on them. So Kai told them after the viral video in California that he had no need to have sex with men like Galfie. He said, quote, do you know how many hot chicks? Never mind. Even if I was gay, do you know how many hot guys wanted to fuck me after that shit? in California. I'm not even being vain. It's just a fact. Like, no offense, but he, meaning Galfi, was not a looker. I mean, who knows? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, like, well, and that's another thing with, like, with any type of a rape allocation. Again, your sexual history shouldn't come into that. Mm-mm. You know? Even if he was having sex with people for money, a place to stay for food, whatever, he still has the right to say no. Yeah. Do to you a know, sexual advance. Yeah. And how many times if the if the perpetrator is on the stand, if the suspect is on the stand, and they've had a history of violent attacks, how many times the judge is like, that's not admissible. That's it's not that doesn't pertain yeah, that doesn't pertain to this case. We're not gonna let allow it to be entered into evidence. And it's like, oh, so the victim mm-hmm. is being 
being tried and, you know, looked at for everything that they've done in the past, but it doesn't pertain to the other person. Right. It just, it doesn't. And like you said, you can be, and I'm not saying this is not like, I'm not saying that Kai was this way, but you can be the most promiscuous person in the entire world. You can let your freak flag fly, do whatever you want to, consenting adults, do it, get it. Doesn't mean that other somebody has the right to do something like this to you. Nobody what, has If that it's right. true or not, yes. Exactly. And the same is true for within a marriage. Like, mm-hmm. covering Lorena Bobbitt made me so mad because they're like, your husband cannot rape you. Oh, but yes, he can. Yeah. Because just, I, I can have sex with my husband three times a day if I want to. But tomorrow, if I don't want to do it, then that's a no. I feel like I I, I like to Why bring it to up. Out? Yeah. The tea. It's the tea. Did you want sweet tea yesterday? Yeah. Do you, does that mean that you have to have it today? No. Because you mm-hmm. might not want it today. Yeah, maybe you we might. Have the tea today. But you might not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's consent. So. Mm-hmm. Kai remained in jail until his trial started, and in June of 2013, he was hospitalized for self-inflicted wounds awaiting trial. His trial did not... Okay, so June of 2013, he's hospitalized. He's already been in in jail since May. His trial didn't take place until April of 2019. Okay. It's almost six years later. It's insane. During his trial, he took the stand in his own defense, and during the cross-examination, he became combative. I don't think that it was a smart move to put him on the stand. What? Di- why? Why? Mm-hmm. Because you don't know what he's going to do. Well, like, he's been labeled as a quote unquote loose cannon. This has not, this trait has not changed in him. It's only going to make him look worse. Why? Yes, and if you as the defense attorney know, because I don't think he should have been found competent to stand trial, so if you as a defense attorney knows that that should be the case, unless he was like, let's put him on the stand so the jury can see that he's not mentally competent to stand trial, I don't know, but I mean, that's a bold move, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off. Like, that obviously did not go in their favor. Right. So if you know that your client is because he tried to have his attorney fired and he tried to represent himself and like all these things that the judge wouldn't allow it because that's not in his best interest. Why the judge never looked at that and said, you know what? I don't think he I don't think he's competent right. mentally to stand trial. We need to get we need to get him into some treatment. Well, yeah. And during closing ready for that, during closing arguments. Kai had an outburst, and it almost caused the judge to expel him from the courtroom. Yeah. If you if you are genuinely doing what you need to do in your own best interest for your own defense, then you're not going to do that. Mm-mm. Like, it's just evidence all over the place of him not being competent. Absolutely. So, Kai was found guilty of first-degree murder and given 57 years in prison, and he had to serve at least 85% of that which is roughly 43 years after the five plus years that he had served awaiting trial. After the trial, Kai appealed, which was denied in August of 2021. He was, or when he was in custody leading up to his trial, Kai was kept in solitary confinement at the Union County Jail. This is 23 hours a day, seven days a week in segregation, which is supposed, or which is considered to be, quote, cruel and unusual punishment. And that is, of course, a gross violation of constitutional rights. Major conflicts of interest are, it's, there's so many in this case. So Yeah, you guys, uh, if you haven't already felt like the need to throw anything out the window, prep the window. that sucker open. Get it ready. Yep. Officials of the court who should have recused themselves among others, one of them, so eventually one judge assigned to the case would step down rather than recuse himself when it was pointed out that he was connected personally to Joseph Gaff- Galfi. Yeah, remember, this was an attorney in the area. Mm-hmm. He knows the judges. He knows the prosecutor. He knows law enforcement. They've been golfed together or whatever. Right. And it doesn't stop there, honestly. So the prosecutor, Theodore Romankov, also, quote unquote, resigned after 11 years when his friendship with the deceased was disclosed. Incidentally or coincidentally, he, quote, called it quits on the same date Kai's arrest was announced. 
There are also numerous issues with the investigation, detention, and trial of Kai. Kai accused the proceedings of being a kangaroo court and sham trial. Many media sources portray his claims as unhinged and conspiratorial. In an investigative report, it was noted that the dishwasher had been run between May 13th and May 15th while Galfi's home was an active crime scene. Now we're getting into John Benet Ramsey's territory here. Also, Galfi was found with his own semen and unidentified blood on his penis. Kai was denied a rape kit, but they did run one on Galfi. The cups that were said to have been used when Galfi drugged Kai with the beer were washed by investigators. A talk screen was ordered on Galfi, and the talk screen and rape kit were both negative, but they were done on the wrong person. Nobody did one on Kai. So at this point, the prosecution can claim, quote, a rape kit was run and that talk screens were inconclusive. And that would make it seem like Kai was a liar, but this hadn't been, this, had this not been a result of a bait and switch, like they, they didn't do them on the right person, but they can still be like, see, we did them and it's inc inconclusive. Yeah, because I just, I don't understand how like a defense attorney either wouldn't have pointed that out or I, I don't know, like the, and maybe this defense attorney did and again the jury was just like well because that's another thing where the prosecution just said we did a rape kit and it was negative they just left out the part that they did it on the wrong person <laughs> on the yeah on on not the person that's claiming he was raped right and no one was claiming not that galfi could claim that he was drugged but that's not what we're talking about here and yeah. fine do one on galfi if you want to but do sure, one on kai do as well yes. yeah yeah Absolutely. Absolutely. Just do 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 the full investigation. Yeah. If you've exactly. got claims of rape and being drugged, do the full investigation. It's running the not... dishwasher, washing those cups mm -hmm. while you're supposed to be collecting evidence. Yeah. So listen to this, though. OK, so of course, you might be wondering why, why the dishwasher thing happened. Right. Um, The former local chief of police um, was uh, Joseph Galfi's brother, James Galfi. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, he's the hell person that was in the house. You know, he, he had control over the scene when things were washed and things were collected. Yes. yes. And it's very strange, too, because according to the, the documents released in Discovery, James Galfi noted his concern that a, quote, drifter was involved when his, he was told that his brother was dead. So that maybe lead you to believe that this is not the first time that he has been involved in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. In another interview with a witness who saw Kai, he was described as looking, quote, glass-eyed and drugged after the incident. The audio of Kai's interrogation has him emitting an audible sigh when he discovers that the man he accuses of drugging and assaulting him is dead. And on top of this, the expert witness, Dr. Robert P Pandina, who refused to run the rape kit on Kai, he claims that he did not know Galfi, and this is a little odd because there was a document from the prosecutor's office which stated that Pandina, quote, unexpectedly received charitable funds from the estate of Joseph Galfi. Hmm. Kind of bizarre, right? If you don't know him, why would that be in his will? Well, hold on. All right. I have a provision in my will. <clears throat> Excuse me. That should I be found murdered that the um any expert witness who testifies on my on the prosecution's behalf in my case i want them to receive a sum of money from my estate okay that's standard that is what i'm talking about sarcasm in a will just good planning too isn't it it's well, sure. just so ridiculous that doesn't I've never heard of that. No. And it, Joseph Galvey is connected to so many different people in the, in this, in the, at the very heart of this, if you want to call it an investigation, I don't know if you can. Mm -hmm. um, all they did was investigate Kai. They didn't investigate anybody else. So I don't know. And I'm not saying that Joseph Galvey deserved to be stomped to death. That is absolutely not right, what I'm saying. Absolutely not. But if you're going to do an investigation, let's do it thoroughly. Let's do it appropriately and ethically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you've got somebody claiming self-defense, then you need to look into that angle. 
Absolutely. Like, it does the evidence support self-defense or not? I mean, you know, th- they do this in cases where somebody says they've shot somebody in self-defense. And I feel like one of the main ways that we see that that either was or was not is because the person who's been shot, quote, in self-defense has had their back turned to them and they've been shot three times in the back or something. You know, they're like, okay, well, that doesn't match. Like, just do the due diligence. Does the evidence match with with Kai's? Yeah, claims or not. Yeah. And we will never know. Mm Mm-mm. I mean, it's been botched, botched job from the get-go. And I don't think anybody wants to see their brother, their friend, their neighbor, whatever, as a as the kind of person who would seem like he's acting in a kind way and just helping someone out, but then drugging and sexually assaulting them. I don't think anybody wants to see that. And I'm absolutely not saying that that's 100% what happened, mm-hmm. but we'll never know because nobody bothered to, mm-hmm. I don't know, check your no. job. Yeah. And because of Kai's, you know, quote, loose cannon personality, and the fact that there are some other mental health issues going on and like all that kind of stuff, he's the perfect person to have in this situation. And he's saying, I've been set up, the investigation wasn't done properly, all that kind of stuff. And so everybody around them and everybody in law enforcement is like, well, he's crazy. Right. Why would you believe what he says? And I know that there was this angle of, well, he claims to have been assaulted the night prior and then went back to his house. I know that that is something that people need to, because you got to have all of the, all of the elements, all of the everything to conduct an investigation properly. But you can't, in my opinion, you can't take just that and then throw everything else away. Let's wash all the dishes. Let's wash everything. Because Mm -hmm. just because he went back if if this if this happened if if Kai is telling the truth if he went back that doesn't mean that he again like the tea thing and I don't even know if the first time was consent I don't if if it's what he right. said is true it wasn't as far as I'm concerned that doesn't mean that he should be you should be able to stay with someone who who offers not under the the understanding that you can be taken advantage of if if they want to again I'm not mm-hmm. saying that any of that is true I don't know. Right. And we'll never, like you said, we'll never know. Yeah. And their whole, I think the prosecution's whole premeditation angle is because he went back. And so they're saying, well, he knew that he was sexually assaulted the first time. He knew he was going to be sexually assaulted again. And so he wanted to do this like vigilante justice sort of thing. Well, and they're taking into account the hatchet situation as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So your premeditation is solely based on the fact that he went back and you're saying he knew he'd been sexually assaulted before. But again, we don't have any evidence that the first time was consensual and we don't even have any evidence that it was not because, again, there was nothing investigated. But how do you know? You don't know. You're just saying that's what he said, but he's lying. Right. You have nothing else. Without anything to prove it. It's just outrageous. It's unreal. Mm-hmm. And so as it stands, Kai is still fighting and maintaining his innocence. And I mean, okay, not really innocence because he admits that it, he murdered Joseph Galfi, but he says that it was in self-defense. He was attacked and raped and he just fought back. And in New Jersey, lethal force is authorized in the case of sexual assault. So accidentally killing someone who is raping you in the state isn't even manslaughter. And Kai claims that there is a cover-up in his case because Galfi was a prominent member of the legal community in the area. And I can see that. I mean, if you take the steps and protocol for something like that, not having his brother investigate the the murder, not having his own brother control the crime scene, um, change of venue so that you don't have jurors that possibly knew him personally and people involved the in the court process. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, all of that. Like, if you take the proper steps, then nobody, then you've got a solid case if you have the evidence there. There's but no unfor- question. Unfortunately, there's no way to go back and redo the investigation because... Can't recollect evidence. It's gone. That's been uh-uh. washed in the damn dishwasher. Mm-hmm. Because if you have those, like, what, finish pods? That, that'll get it right clean. I mean, come on. I've seen the commercials. I just... I do it every night. 
after I've had dinner. Right. Yeah. I remember those. Yeah. Yeah. They're fairly new. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's just if you do your job, there aren't questions like that's what I don't. This is one of the only areas in the whole world where you can just be like, yeah, I didn't write it down. Yeah, I didn't whatever. I didn't think it had anything to do with it. And and people just be like, well, OK, fine. Um, mm-hmm. Not the way it's supposed to happen. You're certainly not going to get fired. My God, that's um, that's just really jumping. Yeah. Through hoops. Um, And uh, you know what? How about we give you a promotion instead? And the repercussion is somebody's entire freedom is taken away for Mm -hmm. essentially the rest of their lives yeah and i'm not i'm not sure i mean i think we're both on the same page with like we're not saying that kai is 100 innocent but we're also not saying that he's 100 guilty because unfortunately we will just never know Mm -hmm. and he certainly needs treatment and I think somebody who is completely unbiased needs to come back in here and do the right thing, whatever that may be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, once, you, once you've been found guilty of something, I mean, you guys know, it's virtually impossible to get it overturned. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's systemic. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Let us know what you guys think. I mean, have you seen the documentary? Did you know all this other stuff? Did you Um, know it when it happened? Yeah, did you know it when it happened? Yeah, I don't remember it. Um, So I don't know. Just let us know. Let us know what you think about it. Um, I think the only thing that you and I can say for sure is that we don't believe this was a fair trial. No, not at all. And I think at the very least, you should have an appeal. And I think that it should be handled fairly. And whatever stands should stand. But Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah... If the evidence is there, that's great. Yes. Let's let's get that evidence out there. But just be fair about it and do your damn yeah. job. Right. And that's it Bye. for today, you guys. It is. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. We love you. And we will hopefully catch you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.